inexplainable prosperity is poverty waiting to happen. That's what happened to Laban. Laban didn't know why he was being blessed. So he ran to Babalao's house to find out why he was being blessed. I, I, I many times have tried to describe and paint the picture of what must have happened. Because, because they, when Laban got to the Babalao's house, you know, he must have been telling Babalao. And don't forget, Laban was a big boy in the city by now. Everybody knew Laban. Everybody knew him. Lady, 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 lady. You know, you have to understand. He, even Babalao knew him well because like now his tight was growing. I believe he must have been paying tight to that Babalao. But cut the long story short. He got there and he started to engage the man and say to him, hey, sir, there's a problem. And Babalao must have said something like, what is the problem? And, and he said, sir, this is a big problem. He said, look, there's no problem that you have that we cannot solve. He said, sir, it is... Sir. Look, Lebi, tell me what the problem is or work out. There's another client at the door. See, Baba, I'm prosperous. Huh? You are what? Say, I'm prosperous. Say, is that a problem? He said, Baba, it's a problem because I don't know why. Mm. Baba said, that's your problem. Say, yes. Say, it's a wonderful problem. Baba said, go and bring one trader load of of rice. <laughs> By the time Baba chopped money well and said, okay, now look, let's now put put the water. Began to chant it. By the time you finish, it says, Baba, what's the Baba? Shh. Baba said, Somebody said, Bella, you should be in Hollywood. <laughs> said, I'm seeing somebody here began to describe the guy. Clearly, it, Laban knew instantly who it was. He didn't even want, bother to want to pay Baba. No, he wanted to run. Baba grabbed his jacket and said, Baby, where, where my money? He said, Baba, I'm coming. He said, well, pay me first. He said, Baba, please, I'm coming. He said, what's the problem? What's the rush? He said, this boy is about to leave with his family. Let me go and stop him. So he quickly ran back home, stopped the the, the, the ABC transport and everybody that had been arranged to. So I said, please, wait. What's the matter? I said, Baba, we are just waiting for you to come back so we can say bye-bye. Say, you can't go anywhere. You can't go anywhere. Say, why? Say, I have just found out by divination. Okay, now somebody, somebody got it. I have just found out by divination that the Lord is with you and that is why I am being blessed. And you know Jacob bad boy. Jacob said you blind. You didn't see that in the Bible. You didn't see you were blind. Right? Okay, wait. For real, you didn't see it. Okay, did you see? Did you not see? Did you not see and you're blind? I did not say. He said, did you not see how the little you have when I came has become much? And see, if you, if you didn't know, if you couldn't track it, didn't you notice where everywhere you put me, the Lord increased you in that place? All you had to do was look at the management report. You should have seen this department was prospering. And when you moved me, you should have seen my department started to prosper. I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. Listen, 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 listen. God blessed Laban regardless of the fact that he was a divination specialist. In other words, stop telling me that it is your boss that has the problem why your company hasn't grown. Your, your boss's problem is not big enough to contain your blessing. Except you are not yet blessed. Let us be real. God blessed Potiphar for the sake of Joseph. Potiphar was not a Christian. He was not a Jew. A despised Jew, but God still blessed him. Your blessing is 
more than enough to blow the mind of now this is the point that i asked like i was telling you the question i asked for you i said is it possible for me to guess that you're a christian is it possible that i can look at your life look at everything about you and conclude or even guess that this guy is a christian ah that's a question that most people are everybody's adjusting their seats much more so when i look at you and i look at the way you are dressed the way you are addressed or the way you address others is there anything within those three parameters that that shows the presence of god because christianity is not about the length of your skirt even though there are certain lengths that even god specifies I keep saying it. Focus creates blindness. If you go into an organization and all... Man of God, can I say something that is very real? Are you sure? Are you sure? Listen, every woman has three things. Three major things. Brains, boobs, bum. Focus creates blindness. If you focus my attention on your boobs, I can't see your brain. If you focus my attention on your brain, I can't see your bum. It's impossible for me to look up and see the ground. You have to understand, I can't do it. So, so you have to learn how to train my attention. When, when, when you open up certain areas that are supposed to be private property, for me to see, then I begin to feel what they call in, 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 in when you, you know, in, in, in finance, they call it invitation to treat. You understand? You, you know what I mean? A public offer requires no invitation. Once, once you make it public, anybody can apply. Regardless of who the existing shareholders were. So don't tell me how married you are. If there are certain matters that are private to your husband and you make them public, well, anybody can apply. Can I guess that you're a Christian? Can I suspect that you're a Christian and maybe be found guilty of my suspicion? Or is it possible that somebody will say she's a Christian and somebody will say, I'll slap you? How can you say she's a Christian? That's a blasphemy. Sorry, don't be angry. Look, I don't mean, what do they mean? They are calling you Christian. You Christian. Can you imagine? Please don't be upset. Or warn yourself. But she goes to church. Eh, she goes to church. That means she's a Christian. A demon saw a man trying to perform a miracle in the name of Jesus. The demon said, listen, the name you are trying to use, we know that name. It's not a problem. We even know the guy you are trying to imitate. <laughs> so your scarf is not what makes you a Christian. <laughs> Neither is your crucifix. Because I've seen massive crucifix between big boobs. I mean, large cleavage, big crucifix. Like, focus your attention on Jesus. <laughs> so that you have to clean your... You say, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, I will not look at the cross. Let's... <laughs> Do you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Are you with? Are, are we? Are we being real? Because we are going somewhere. We're trying to understand the kind of people that are truly God's people. 
don't forget that there are many people called by his name. But, he says, if they will humble themselves. This means there are people who are called by his name, but are arrogant, they are proud, they are full of themselves. And I always say when you're full of yourself, it's difficult to lift you up. It's very, very difficult to get promoted, to be lifted up. You're too full. You're too full. There are two things that can really, really hold you down. There are weights you've got to learn how to lay aside. Number one, number one is yourself, your self-perception. Your self-perception is an incredible ego, they call it. It's very heavy. Very heavy. You've got to learn. And please don't be fooled that only men have ego. Ego has no gender. It has a gender. No, you didn't hear what I said. Ego has no gender, but it has a gender. Ego always has a place, an intention, uh, uh, an ambition to back it up. Ego has all of those things. The second thing that, is, that you can be full of that can make you so difficult to lift you is called potential. And I need you to understand, potential is everything you can do but you have not yet done. Potential is everything you can be but have not yet become. Potential is everything you can have but you have not yet possessed. It's everything you can accomplish but have not yet achieved. And from the day that you were created, not formed, created, the Lord loaded you with potential for your assignment on earth. Do you understand this? Does this make sense? There's somebody I'm looking at, she's not connecting with me yet. Does this make sense? Thank you. All right? So when you were created, before you were formed, God had given you an assignment and he had given you the potential, the anointing, the talents, the giftings, all of that to be able to accomplish your assignment on earth. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? I can't hear you. Does it make sense? Okay. Now you have to understand that your anointing was meant for the earth, not for heaven. There is no anointing that is useful in heaven. Let me, let me address it in another way. Your talent has no need in heaven. For instance, do you know that as lovely as Pastor Shola is and his beautiful wife they are, how many people love our pastor? How many people will like Pastor Shola to continue to preach till his last days on earth, even when he's old and gray? How many people want to hear the word of God? Listen, from the day this man breathes his last breath, he's retired as a pastor. You know why? You know why? In heaven, there's no sinner. No altar call. No word. You are already living in the word. Not just living in the word. So, do you understand? Do we have any doctors in the house? Yeah, the doctors. Let me see the medical doctors. Anybody medical doctor here? Ah, please, you always need medical doctor. Right? Eh? Ma, sir, please, can I bust your bubble? Nobody is sick in heaven. Do you understand? So whatever you can't treat on earth, forget it. No patients, no out call, no outpatient, no ambulance, no nothing. Forget it. Your anointing is not meant for heaven. Your anointing is meant for the earth. For that reason, all that you were loaded with was to come to the earth to offload. So you are loaded to offload. That's your job. In the process of offloading, you lighten the burden that you are carrying. Because potential is a load. And it's a burden. And it's a burden because it's what you must do because you can do it. I can do it and therefore I must do it. That I can do it has no meaning to the earth. Nigeria is a potentially great nation. Yeah. Understand potential cannot be lived in, it can be driven, it cannot be enjoyed. Potential is an obligation, it's not a blessing to you. It's a blessing to mankind. Your potential is a blessing to mankind, it's not a blessing to you. It's an obligation to you, it's, an, it's a burden to you. So what you can do is what you must do. And the faster you are able to do it, the greater the opportunity to offload. 
As you are offloaded, you are lightened so you can be lifted. So you notice that people who tend to usually get to the top are people who have done a lot. So now I have the capacity, I offload it. I offload it. Everything I can do, I do. I can write books, so I write. I can sing, I sing. I can do, you know, I, I do everything. I can manage people, I manage. I can administer, I administrate. I, you know, I, I can do it, so I do it. And as I do it, I offload. And as I offload, I get lighter. And now I begin to rise. So the people who are doers are the ones that are risers. Does this make sense to you? So some people are still waiting to rise because of their potential. They are carrying their potential everywhere. Their potential is weighing them down. They can make a million dollars, but they haven't. They can give a million dollars, but they haven't. Sometimes your money is a potential. Because it's a potential in the kingdom of God. It's a mandate that God has given you. God gave it to you so he could do something, but you're still carrying it in your account. So it's weighing your account down. Does anybody feel me? I told you I'm going to wrap all of these things up for you. And I'm about to do it now. I'm about, are you ready? So when the purpose of a thing is not known... I wonder what you're abusing right now. Can I just quickly tell you one thing that we might be abusing? So turn with me to Revelation chapter 5, and I'll start from verse 9. I want to tell you one thing that we could be abusing that could cause us serious danger. If you don't mind let me read to you from verse 8 is it okay all right cool and now when he capital h meaning jesus had taken the scroll the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense which are the prayers of the saints and they sang a new song saying you who is you? Uh uh. No? Who is you? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Are you are you there? Okay, you can see. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open it. For you, who is you again? Okay, so let's do it this way. For Jesus was slain and have redeemed who? No, no, show me one of us. Okay, so he has redeemed to God by whose blood? Okay, so now you see that Jesus had been slain. Jesus had let, he literally shed his blood so that you and I could be redeemed out of every tribe. Now, I need you to underline the word out of. Because this is the word that hardly do most people see. Out of every tribe is a kingdom system. It wasn't just out of Yoruba and out of Hausa and out of Igbo. Every industry has a tribe. A tribe is a group of people with a similar mindset, a similar purpose and a similar mandate. And every tongue, meaning there is a language that is spoken. When IT people begin to speak, they have a language. Men, medical doctors begin to speak. You think they, are, they, are, they must be Greek or something because they are speaking about something kolokokus and another one makrokokus. And then, you know, I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. And some of you may have noticed that when you go into the midst of economists, there is a language that they speak. And it's not just, I mean, even terminologies that you and I, simple things that you can say, I wanted to buy it. They call buying purchase. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know why you, why must you not be able to say buy? Why must you use purchase? You know? Why you, I don't know whether you understand what I'm saying. There is a, somebody say tongue. There is, there are tribes and there are tongues. And they have nothing to do with where you were born or who you were born to. It's a thinking. It's a pattern. 
this is what he asked of us to do in Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to a pattern of thinking of this world, tribe and tongue. So if we are not to be conformed to the tribe and tongue, what are we supposed to be and do? And has made us made us. We are created in the image of God. Our job is not to become Christians. Our God is to become kings. He has made us. Made is different from create. God created man in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. He formed man in, verse, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. God created man in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. But he formed man in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Then he made woman. He made woman. Later. He f- created man, formed him, then he made woman. The word made I'm going to try and remember the I'll try and remember the, 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 the Greek for it. The word made is to fit to perfection. The word formed is fit for purpose. So when God the word made is the word panel in, in Hebrew. It's the word panel. When God panad women it was for perfection. When God honed man, it was for function. That's why men have big ears. Women have dainty ears. Look, no, just look at any man around you. Look at the size of their nose. Can you see it? It's for breathing. It's not for beauty. Your, listen, women, your nose is for beauty. Men, their nose is for breathing. You know? You understand? The word formed is the same word as yatsa. Yatsa is to put together so that it works. The word for made is the word pana. The word pana means to, to finish, to, to make for beauty, for perfection. Now he's saying when we are going to be perfected, we will be panad into kings and priests and this is the effect of that panel that we shall reign on the earth let me close my contemplation so that I can give you something for for tomorrow this is what we're going to do with tomorrow and I wish we could still have church as one tomorrow I wish tomorrow I'm going to be talking about about how you become the king and priest that you are meant to be. And and I will tell you a very quick story and that's how I'm going to end this matter. In 2001, I I was living under some very intense situations. Uh, Now you should have started guessing what I'm talking about. I looked at my wife one day and I told her, I said, girl, you're crazy. She said to me, are you joking or you're serious? I said, do I look like I'm joking? I said, you're crazy. She said, why would you want to insult me? That's not like you. I said, because I just looked at our wedding picture. And you are crazy. I said, even me, I would not have married me. You must be local. I was wearing a neck 15 shirt and it had gathers. My size 40 jacket was a blend between something like boo-boo and agbada. You couldn't tell which one. If I wrapped it all like this, the, the button would have got it to the other side. And now you can see the world has become flesh. And, 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 and this was how I was prior to that time. So here it is. I, I, I was living in a one-bedroom room. 
I didn't say one bedroom apartment. I said one bedroom. It was a self-contained room for it contained nothing apart from itself. God is my witness to everything I tell you. My wife will also mention it if she were here. My wife knew how neat I was because of the number of books and how I arranged my books in the order of gogololarity. Highest to one side, lowest to one side. I had two pairs of shoes. One was a slippers, black slippers. The other one was a shoe, one shoe. My clothes were hanging on a nail, all of them two hangers, one nail. I had two Senegalese and I picked the colors nicely. They were not colors you could tell whether it was the one, same one you saw last week or not. So some of you, some of you, some of you need wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. You have only one jacket, you buy color red. So now everybody knows that that's that brother. They say, well, which brother? They say, ah, I don't you know red jackets. <laughs> How many people ever heard of a guy called Red Fox? Red Fox was an old comedian because he had one shoe red. So everybody used to call him red. When he was growing up, one red shoe. And that was what he used to wear all, every time. So they called him red, red, red. It became his name. But this is the point that I'm saying. This was an intense situation I had. At that time, my room had nothing in it. I had a carpet that had a hole in it. My mattress was strategically placed on that hole. And sometimes my friend would come and say, Fela, which kind of style? He said, I just, you just like style too much. If you touch that mattress. <laughs> they didn't know what was under that mattress. I also had another furniture. It was a cane dust bin by the side of my bed. Okay? And that was the occupant of the room, apart from myself. And, and there, this was, these were very intense times. You see, not that I had not seen money before, but I had, I had been in Philips Consulting. I did extremely well in Philips Consulting. By the time I was in Philips Consulting, I had seven designer suits. When God called me and said he wanted me to follow him and he would make me, uh, I didn't know he was going to ask me to give everything I had. And so now I was at, you know how you can be lower than ground zero. You know, I was not just broke, I was broken. I, I think that there's nothing that can be bad in life than but for you to have no money and nobody to owe you. I think it's very comforting to have debtors. If you have a little bit of money, give somebody, say, take it. Take on me. I say borrow me. Just so that one day when you are broke, even look, it's not even the size of the money that matters. Then I have 50 bucks. Don't be thinking, ah man, I need to call brother. Ah, I need to call brother something. I have some money with him now. <laughs> it at least elevates you. So I did not have any debt all. Nobody anywhere to call for anything. And I didn't have any money and I had not eaten anything. And on this particular day, I was going to bed hungry and, and God is my witness. I did not know whether I would wake up. And listen, my brother was working in an oil company. And there are only two boys. But God had never allowed me to go to any man to ask of him anything. So here I was about to go to bed. And honestly, I honestly did not know if I was going to make it. And as I was about to just lay down on my bed, I heard the Lord say to me, Kings do not lie on your neighbors. <laughs> and I thought that must be true. Maybe I will tell the king when I see him. <laughs> and he said to me, Get up. You're a king. I said, King? He said, Yes. I said, Okay. Lord, because you asked me to. So I got up to just tuck in my, my bed sheet. Oh, that the mattress, not bed though. Because to call it bed sheet might mislead you. I think that bed sheet is a sheet that covers a bed. When it is a mattress, it must be called something else. My cover cloth. <laughs> so as I was about to tuck in my cover cloth, I lifted it and behold, I found five naira in the hole. Neat five naira. Now, I know 
you know, there's some things all people can tell you, but I know that that five naira was not there. Because like you said, like my wife said, I'm a very neat guy. Even in my poverty, I was neat. With my one, listen, I had one shoe and one slipper and may God bless the dust that touched my slipper. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? My, my Senegalese was 90% starch and 10% cotton. I will iron one Senegalese for 38 minutes. Listen, listen, you have to understand. In all of my going through, I knew that wasn't who I was. You, you, you have to understand, money can determine the quality and the quantity of what you buy. But it is your impression of who you are that, de that determines the expression that you gave. And so, essentially... I found five naira. I grabbed that five naira. I didn't even say thank you, Lord. I ran down the road and bought a packet of shortbread. You know shortbread? As I cried, tell her to take one and just use it like Panadol. I felt the Lord say to me, kings do not eat on the streets. I thought this king matter is a very, very, very frustrating matter. So I went back, knocked on my neighbor's place, and I got a, I had a plate, but no food. That's potential. So I collected water, cold water from my, my neighbor. I poured it into it. I arranged the four pieces of shortbread. I knelt down. By this time, I'd laid my bed. I knelt down, and I said, thank you, Lord, for this. This was in 2001. And I ate it. I put it in. Then I picked it up again. Because I had to eat like a king, you know. But a few years later, I went to see a man of God. I was in the city of London, and, and uh, how many people know uh, what? No, no, pastor of, uh, in, the, in the UK. Pastor. No, no, no. A, a redeemed. And pastor, pastor Agu. So Pastor Agu heard that I was in town. He said, oh, I need to see you. So I went to see him, and, um, and there was a lady who was sitting with me at, at the entrance. By this time, many things had started to happen. I had not only gotten married, even though in that same one room I room, because God told me I was going to get married on my 30th birthday. But within six months of being married, I had moved my wife into Victoria Garden City. God had told me that I should go into the banking sector and consult. And he had given me favor there for the first time, at least to the best of my knowledge, in consulting, Nigerian consulting history. A startup company had started to consult for about seven banks in one year. By, two, by the second year, going on third year, I was consulting for 14 banks. Many people who are bankers will tell you today that they met me in banking. And I was directing their customer management strategy, customer management processes. If I enter into any bank, there was nowhere that I went that I did not have parking space. I don't know whether you get what I'm trying to say. I mean, I had become a big boy. And, 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 and soon, God started to speak to me about a nation called Nigeria. And he was saying to me on the 23rd of November, 2004, that, you know, I need you to, to understand this, that, that by December 31, 2025, Nigeria will be undoubtedly the world's most desirable nation to live in. I'm excited by your amen. amen. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I'm excited. On that day, I was not excited. And you have to understand why I wasn't excited because six weeks before then, the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States had said that Nigeria was going to be a failed state by 15 years. So by 2019, they were saying there was not going to be any nation called Nigeria. They will have four nations. One of them will be called Odua Republic. The other one will be called Calabari Republic. The other one will be called Arewa Republic. And the last one will be called Biafra Republic. And that, and that there will be no Nigeria. And you have to understand, by this time, the movement for the actualization of the sovereign state of Biafra had already issued the Biafran pound. And it was trading as an illegal tender in three cities in Nigeria. The, the Odua People's Congress had issued Obasanjo an ultimatum that if he did not release Frederick Fashion and Ganyu Adams, they were going to burn the Southwest down. 
the Arewa Consultative Forum had also issued a, a communique saying if the next president after Obasanjo was not a northerner, that, that the Nigerian experiment was over. The movement for the emancipation for, of the Niger Delta had said that they were no longer going to be an agitation group, they were going to become a militant group. So, so when you look at all that was happening, it was extremely tough to say, how can God be saying that Nigeria will be... So I said, amen, no. That was the amen of Sarah. It was loaded with unbelief. And God said to me, I do not pray. Who will I pray to? The second thing God said to me, he said, I am not a prophet. I speak to the prophets, but I'm not a prophet. The third thing he said to me, he said, your past, your present, and your future are all in my present. That is why I am that I am, not I was when I used to be. He said to me, when I tell you about 2025, I'm not telling you what I'm going to do by 2025. I'm telling you what I have done, but which you may see. I didn't process the word may see for many years. I said to him, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, now go and raise me. Go and build me the people that will build the nation. So I started speaking to people about Nigeria. And if you go and look at the real track record of this thing, Goldman Sachs had not said Nigeria was going to be amongst the 20, top 20 economies by 2025. Goldman Sachs never said 2020. Goldman Sachs said top 20 and by 2025. That happened in 2005. This was 2004. When I started to speak about the future of Nigeria, nobody, everybody looked at me as a crazy guy, but you know what? I love the way he says it. Praise the Lord. So I was like a, a lone ranger speaking from the wilderness. And to cut the long story short, God asked me to go and raise a generation. Somebody say we need generation. That is empowered, motivated, and stirred to operate with natural excellence. This he spoke to me in May 2005 as I was having a meeting with some guys and he said, gemstone. I had noticed that the mouth of the people were moving, but I couldn't hear their words. For a moment I was, I was beginning to think that maybe I had lost my hearing. And then I heard the word gemstone. And I thought, what is gemstone? And he said, raise me a generation that is empowered, motivated, and stirred to operate in natural excellence. He said, these are the leaders that will build Nigeria. They will build their nation, shape their continent, and shake the earth positively for me. I'm going somewhere. Now listen, listen. So here it was, after all of these things had happened, sometime in 2006, 2007, Pastor Agu had heard of all these things that this young man was doing. And all this crazy guy that was talking about the future of Nigeria. So he called me to have a meeting because he heard I was in London. And as I sat down beside this lady who was trying to see him, a British lady, she said to me, so young man, please tell me, what do you do? And I said, well, you know, when I left, I used to work in a place called Phillips Consulting, I left, uh, and I don't know why I had to tell her the story. And I told her how I, I, God had asked me to go and set up a place called Eden, Christian Lifestyle and Entertainment. And God said to me, go and, I'm turning you into the, into the marketplace to be a kingdom financer as a general over an army of people who will finance the kingdom. Until today, people wonder and amazed how it's possible that somebody can make an altar call for kingdom financiers and, and there will be no space. And I don't understand. I guess it's just my calling or my sending. Many are called, few are sent. And so, so caught the long story short, she, when I told her what I was and what I used to do as a, and what I was doing as a, as a business consultant she, and, and what God had told me to do as a, to, with concerning Nigeria and to raise a generation, she said to me, do you know who you are? And I, and I thought, that, well, I thought you asked me what I do. I, yeah. She said, you are a king. I thought, what do you mean I'm a king? She said, didn't you hear? Didn't you hear all you said to me? Did you not say to me, God asked you to go and build his kingdom? I said, yes. He said, God asked you to build institutions. I said, yes. He said, God asked you to build a nation. I said, yes. He said, God asked you to build a generation. I said, yes. He said, don't you get it? King, kingdom, institution, nation, generation. 
And at that instant, the presence of God, the same exact presence that I heard that day, came on me and I started to cry. And God said to me, now people have to understand this. That's why kings have nothing to do with gender. The king of England is a woman. A king is a kingdom builder. Somebody say with me, kingdom builder. Institution builder. Nation builder. And generation builder. This is us in perfection. Made. Panad. Panad to perfection when we come out of our former thinking. So I'm not as I'm not a citizen of Nigeria, I'm a custodian of this nation. Hallelujah. Tomorrow I'm going to be talking to you about this mandate. How you can enter into your place. I will start off our discourse tomorrow by telling you what the danger of not doing it is. Because the Bible says there is an evil under the sun. And it says I have seen it, so it's very obvious. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, as long as the heir to the throne, which means someone with the potential to reign, does not do what he has the potential to do, he's no different from a slave. Though he's not a slave, but he's no different. In other words, your experience in life is like that of a slave. And, and you have to understand, nature abhors vacuum. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10, or 10 verse 5, I think, 10 verse 5, he says, I have seen an evil under the sun, and it is the error of this ruler. Tomorrow we will look at rulership and leadership. This is going to be very important. Nigeria has been ruled for about 55 years, closing. In fact, actually, to be honest with you, for quite a few centuries, because we've had traditional rulers, and God never intended for traditional rulers. He intended for royal fathers. And we went from traditional rulers to colonial rulers. And from colonial rulers, we had some leaders, and but unfortunately, we quickly went into military rulers again. And under the military rulership, they now finally handed over to, to the ruling party. <laughs> We're going to discuss that sometime tomorrow. What I want to prepare you for is for you to be able to ask and answer a few key questions tomorrow. Lord, where is my kingdom? Because your kingdom was assigned to you before you got to the earth. You don't you don't determine your kingdom, you discover your kingdom. And then you find your kingdom, you engage the palace and you sit on the throne. And tomorrow I'm going to give you that process very quickly. How to become a ruler over the earth. The Bible says, and we shall reign on the earth. Do you understand that the intention of God was not for man to come to heaven. Man was never supposed to die in the first place. The first man that was created was never supposed to die. Therefore, there was no heaven to go to. Do you know that? I'm not going to go into this revelation because it's for tomorrow. Somebody say tomorrow. Say it again tomorrow. Ask the person next to you, are you going to be there tomorrow? I just want some people who know in their soul that God has called them to be kings and priests understand it's not king or priest it's king and priest remember a priest is one who takes the earthly matters to God and a king is one who takes godly matters to the earth so as a king your back is to God, your face is to man. As a priest, your back is to men, your face is to God. So you take the matters arising, bad roads, corruption, you take it to God, then God gives you an assignment. And then you take the assignment and there's no further discussion again. 
come. And you carry the word and the word carries you. Do you understand? You are not looking for what to do. You are sent. There are many people who are, who are walking, but they are not sent. You've got to receive the word, and then you've got to do the work. Word, work. Word, work. As a priest, you receive the work. As a king, you receive the word. As a king, you do the work. Where the word is in alignment with the work, then there's a reigning. Is there anybody who's ready to reign here? There are some people, their mind has been so depraved of their capacity to reign that they are fine where they are. Your comfort zone is where your discomfort meets with your comfort. An uncomfortable situation, you have adjusted yourself to the perfection so that now you are not even feeling it as much. So you don't have light, but thank God you have generator. The road to your house is bad, but thank God now you've got a jeep. The schools are bad. The same school you went to, you can't send your children to. Shame on you. Shame. Every generation must run their race in a way that gives advantage to the next generation. Don't forget, if you empower your child, but you don't empower his generation, you have only turned him into a target. For in the abundance of an impoverished lot, a privileged few is an endangered species. It is foolishness to send your children to, to the best schools abroad because they will have to come home someday, even if to visit. Even if for no other reason, for your funeral, they will come home. And whatever happens, you may not be there to defend them. There is no true success in a failed state. It is in your best interest and that of your children that your nation does better. And a wasted generation is one that was born into good hospitals, but now their children can't go to those hospitals. Were born into good schools, got good education, but they can't give the same education at the same cost for the children. That's a wasted generation. I refuse for yours to be a wasted generation. Amen. I'm sent not only as a kingdom builder, I'm sent to build global institutions out of Nigeria. Hallelujah. I am sent to build the nation of Nigeria into a most desirable nation to live in. Anybody want to live in that nation? Yeah. I am sent to raise a generation, somebody say with me, generation, generation. that is empowered, that is empowered. Motivated, motivated, and stirred to operate with natural excellence. Is there any other king in this room like myself? Please just rise on your feet. Let me know where the kings are. Is there any king here? Tomorrow we are going to find out how to operate in our mandates. But only mandated people can carry the kind of, of anointing and wealth and grace that is required. When the anointing and grace and the mandate of God comes upon you, your age, nothing, nothing becomes, nothing matters. Where you come from does not matter. Nobody knows your tribe. Nobody cares. You are too great to be associated with one tribe. Yeah. When you are not big enough, people can call you by the name of your tribe. When you are big enough, the whole nation calls you by your name. Mm. They say he's a Nigerian. Mm. Philip Emeguad, do you know where he's from? Mm. Do you care? Mm. When Nigeria wins World Cup, nobody cares where the individuals are from. Mm. Stephen Keshi, nobody cares. We love him. <laughs> you want you to... As long as you win, yeah. when you are languishing in mediocrity is when they know where you are. Yeah. <laughs> where you are from is not as important as where you are going. Yeah. Somebody say, I'm a nation builder. I'm a, I'm a kingdom builder. I'm a an institution builder. I'm a, a nation builder. I'm a and a generation builder. With those hands that you have already raised up to the Lord, why don't you just worship him? Just begin to worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord.